Well, I'm here again with uh, Massimo Piliucci on Blogging Hits TV. Uh, Massimo, uh, you want to give a little brief introduction of yourself, and then I'll do the same, and we can get started. Sounds good. Um, I'm Massimo Piliucci. I'm the KD Irani Professor of Philosophy at City College, the City University of New York. And I'm Daniel Kaufman. I'm Professor and Program Director in the Philosophy Department at Missouri State University. So today, Massimo, we're going to uh, talk about the subject of scientism, um, which uh, is somewhat uh, a little bit related to what we talked about last time insofar as some of the people that we talked about certainly embrace a scientistic worldview. Um, and um, there was a, uh, uh, th there's been several threads on your new webzine, Santia Salon, on the topic of scientism, one explicitly on scientism written by John Shook. So maybe right. we might start off with a definition. Um, Shook, in his article for you, gave like a 26-part definition. <laughs> but I I, I'm hoping that you could give maybe a, a simpler one, and then I'll weigh in on it. Well, I think that, uh, yeah, you're right. There's there's probably as many definitions as, as people that have been thinking about this stuff. Um, but I think that, broadly speaking, they really do fall into two broad categories. Uh, on the one hand... There are people such as myself who tend to use the word in a sort of a negative fashion. And what we mean by scientism is something on the lines of a inordinate overconfidence in the methods and results of science. And we can unpack that because there's quite a bit to unpack in, in there. Uh, then there is, a, so the positive side um, of, the, of the debate, these are people, uh, both a number of scientists and actually a number of philosophers, who think that, uh, who have essentially studied wearing the, 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 the label as a badge of honor, and they say, yeah, that's right, science does have or will have eventually potentially all the answers, and so we're, we're fine with that. Uh, and so they don't think that there is actually a serious demarcation or an interesting demarcation of science from any other kind of intellectual activity aimed at discovery. Now that I think about it, actually, there is a third um, usage, and that tends to be tends to be um, deployed by. It's also negative, but it tends to be deployed by people who I really rather not associate myself. Uh, and these are, you know, people who suggest that there are uh, other ways of knowing outside of science, and by which they usually mean some kind of mystical or religious access to an alternative reality, that sort of stuff. Now, now I don't I don't think that's a reasonably uh, you know, interesting usage of the term. So I, I completely discard that kind of um, um, that that aspect of of, uh, of the debate. Although, unfortunately, it is precisely the presence of those people and the use of the word scientism by, let's say, supporters of intelligent design that really makes the the debate between the other two sides more acrimonious, probably than it, than it should be. Yeah, yeah. Um, just for sake of uh, ease of discourse. How do you normally refer to the people who embrace scientism? <laughs> it's a good question, right? Because there's an actual <laughs> term for that. I mean, it's a, you just you you are characterized by having a scientific attitude, but of course you cannot use the word scientist because that one is taken for you know for a neutral, um, if not a slightly honorific uh, meaning. So there really is no uh, no accepted word. And uh, again, because engaging in scientism or being scientistic it's uh, uh it's supposed to be an insult you know most most people mean it as an insult not a, not as a positive thing uh presumably people haven't thought about giving a um a, a term i mean some of my readers on santia salon uh use the word scientists but i i i really don't want to go there yeah i actually wrote scientismist which right. uh which seems sort of awful but um we'll just have to we'll have to work around it um yeah let, let me let me maybe perhaps try and focus the definition a little bit. It seems to me that people who embrace scientism have both a, a very specific conception of, on the one hand, explanation, uh, right. what, it, what it is to explain some uh, phenomenon, some event, some whatever it is you're seeking to explain, and that in tandem with that, they have a specific, very specific conception of understanding, right, where right. understanding is broadly understood as possession of the relevant explanations. Uh, right. And then thirdly, it seems to me they have a distinctive conception of why we want that understanding and thus those explanations. In other words, the value 
uh, of explanation of the of explanation and understanding. Does that strike you as a as a fair way of of, of parsing uh, the, the issue, making you breaking it down, and then we can talk specifically about what their conception of explanation and understanding is? Uh, yes, I would also add that there is uh, a, a, the two camps. And by the way, when I refer to the two camps, as I sort of briefly described above, of course that. Uh, needs to acknowledge that there's actually a variety of positions within each camp. So there's, you know, it's not like everybody who is critical of scientism uh, thinks like myself, and you know, everybody who is in favor of it thinks like I don't know James Lediman, for instance, to name to name a philosopher um, who is on the other side. So the, um, uh, I would add a, a fourth component, which is the two camps seem to have a uh, distinct. Uh, sufficiently distinct conception of what counts as science. Oh. And, and in fact, I think that that is probably the most crucial distinction of them all. Uh, we, can, we, we can start talking about the other three that you, you, you mentioned, but I think that, that, that really the, at the at bottom is that I tend to have a fairly restricted conception of science uh, and some of these people ha tend to have, on the other side, tend to have a, a overly uh, extensive conception of, of what counts as science. Right. Or although I guess depending on how you mean restricted and extended, I, I, I think one of the things I'm going to want to say is that the people who embrace scientism really, at the end of the day, think that the only real sciences are physical sciences. Uh, yeah, they, they, that's right. But they would never actually admit that because if they admitted that, then they would actually subscribe to a conception of science that is even more restricted than my own. And that would sort of shoot themselves in the foot at that right. point. <laughs> well, let me let me then let me let me then go ahead and, and, and offer a, a, a draft of what I would say. I, I think the scientismists, I'm sorry, um, <laughs> Uh, conception of explanation and understanding is, and maybe maybe you can either agree or disagree. It seems sure. to me that um, people who embrace scientism think that to genuinely explain something, you have to either give an explanation that's explicitly in terms of physical causes, right. or if the explanation is in terms of other sorts of causes, let's say uh, folk psychological causes, for example, that at least those must be reducible to physical causes. That is, it must be shown that what is being claimed as uh, the cause is identifiable or equivalent to some uh, physical cause. Would you, would you agree with that? I think that's correct. And that goes, uh, I think, to the bottom of, uh, to, to, to the heart of, of a distinction that unfortunately not enough people make on where they make it. It's not I don't think it's sufficiently clear. And that is between, we're talking about reductionism, essentially. You know, can you reduce the explanation of, let's say, psychological phenomena or biological phenomena to physical ones? And, of course, as you know, as soon as we you start talking about reduction, the, the, the first distinction that one should make, and that which, um, if appropriately understood uh, in a knowledge, would actually probably end the debate right there, is a distinction between epistemic and ontological reductionism. So, uh, briefly, ontologically speaking, uh, a reductionist claim would be that all there is in the world are quarks or strings or whatever it is that fundamental physics tells us the fundamental, the foundations of, of the world are made of, and therefore that anything else ought to be understood in principle as uh, quarks or strings interacting with each other, okay? Right. Now, that position, um, I think, is... Uh, Clearly hard to to reject. I mean, you know, the the world really is in fact made of uh, quarks or strings or whatever. And so, at some very abstract level, it is certainly the case that uh, you know biological phenomena and physical phenomena are the result of very very high level, very very complex interactions among quarks. But nonetheless, interactions among quarks they are. Right. Um, at an epistemic level, however, the question is, yes, but is, is the quantum mechanical or the string theoretical level really the best, the most informative or the most feasible uh, level at which we should seek explanations as human beings? And the answer clearly there, I think, is equally clearly no. Uh, nobody has ever produced, probably ever will produce, and certainly has no idea of how to produce a quantum mechanical theory that explains, I don't know, Shakespeare's sonnets, for instance. Uh, or even why we're having this conversation. In other words, a, a quantum mechanical theory of psychology. Right. right. So if that is if that's understood right there, that should kind of stop a lot of discussions because 
it would make clear that when we're talking about scientism and sort of the inordinate um, faith, if you will, uh, or about the fact that science will eventually answer all questions or, 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 the, or, or uh, too much confidence in the results of science. We're clearly talking epistemically. We're talking about science as a human activity. We're not talking about uh, whatever foundations, uh, physical foundations, make up the universe. So because the debate is epistemic, not ontological, then uh, it seems to me that it's pretty obvious that there are limits to science just because there are limit, epistemic limits to human knowledge, period. Um, so I, don't, I really have a hard time, you know, I'm trying to be really chargeable to so the other side, but I'm having a hard time uh, understanding why people keep sort of mistaking the two or confusing the two, um, the two levels of the scores. Uh, and it ought to be clear that if we're talking epistemically, obviously there are, this, there are limits to science. And obviously, in a lot of cases, you know, you, if you want to understand, for instance, Shakespeare's sonnets, you don't ask a physicist. You, you, you ask a um, you know, literary critic or a poet or something like that. Right. Well, I think part of the reason why I, I think people, people don't make this distinction often enough, and I think maybe it's worth repeating this for the audience, um, given that the audience here uh, is, is partly a lay audience, if you want to call it that. Um, that is, just because everything is ultimately made of matter does not mean that every explanation Right. That every that the best explanation for everything is always a material explanation, or a, better put, an explanation in the language of basic physics. Right. Right. Um, right. And, and that's because explanations are human constructs. Right. I mean, you know, let's assume that the laws of physics, whatever they are, because that's a whole other you know discussion that we could have. But let's say that the laws of physics really are sort of objectively out there. Uh, they are. Uh, regularities by which, you know, exceptionalist regularities by which the universe works and all that sort of stuff. Fine. But when we talk about an explanation, let's say even of physical phenomena, you know, wh why is it that the moon, uh, you know, goes around the, the, the earth and why does it only sh always show, show us one face? Even in physical explanations, these are human epistemic constructs. And even that explanation, which is an explanation of a physical phenomenon, it's not usually presented in terms of quantum mechanics. Yeah. Simply because quantum mechanics is not very helpful when you want to describe, you know, astronomical phenomena. It just doesn't get you there as a human being. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Hilary Putnam, the philosopher Hilary, Hilary Putnam, has this example from uh, a paper called Philosophy in Our Mental Life mm -hmm. uh, of trying to explain why a round peg fits through the round hole but doesn't fit through the square hole. Right. Or, or it's the other way around. Why a square peg fits yeah. through the square hole and not through the round hole. And he says, you could give an elaborate quantum mechanical description of right. the pegs, the board, the holes, and everything else. But at the end of the day, you wouldn't have gotten as good an explanation of why one the peg fits through one another than if you had simply given an account in terms of the, the ordinary language description of its geometry. Right? Right. Exactly. Um, and, and that's sort of the way that he, that he makes that point. And I think, actually, it's a point that... that too many philosophers and a lot of people uh, who were, were classifying as scientists uh, don't, don't make. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. And you know, it is well understood in philosophy of science and epistemology that uh, there may be uh, more than one proper level or, or, or useful level. When I say proper, in this case, I mean, I mean useful level of explanation. Usually that level of explanation is, is to be found one or two levels of complexity below the object of that needs to be explained, right? So, so if I sometimes not quite that easy, but for instance, um, if I want to understand, I don't know, genetic variation within a species, a population of biological organisms, uh, my explanations are going to be both at the populational level. I need to understand, let's say, things like you know migration patterns, uh, and so individuals moving from from one uh, place to another. Uh, and uh, I need also a, a genetic level of explanation. I need to understand something about the genes of which those individuals are, are, are made, you know, are constituted. But I don't go all the way down to not only quantum mechanics, I don't even go to molecular physics or, you know, or, right. or anything like that, because that's just not useful. Uh, that's not to say that population of organisms are not made of quarks or biomolecules. It's just that when you go f that far in terms of explanatory level, from the level of the phenomenon, you just don't do anything useful from uh, the point of view, you know, the epistemic point of view of a human being. That's right. And this issue of whether or not the explanation is useful, I think, is crucial 
because it begs the question of, you know, useful for what? Um, right. And so I want to get to that in a minute. But let me just ask you one more thing about reductionism before we move on to that question of understanding and what it's useful for. Um, is there not even though some pressure on the idea of ontological reductionism? That is, while uh, philosophers make a distinction between what's called uh, a token and type physicalism. Yeah. Um, and let's say that we all agree that some you, sort of... You might want to explain that. I'm, for, I'm for about to. Oh, okay. okay so, good. So, so let's say we'd all agree that um, materialism is true, uh, certainly true in, in the sense of uh, a token physicalism. That is that every individual thing that exists in the universe is ultimately made of matter, right? Um, uh, that said, however, that does not mean that every type of thing that every category or classification is a classification of physics. So right. one of the a classification in physics. So you know one of the examples that's famously given by Jerry Fodor uh, in his, uh, in my opinion, crucial paper. Special. It's called Special Sciences. Um, Fodor says, you know, being a currency. <laughs> is a category, right? right? A currency as in, uh, you know, the United States has a currency, France has a currency. Right. Um, but there, that, that does not represent a physical kind, right? right? There are indefinitely many physical things that can count as currencies. And so while right. every individual currency as a token is going to be some sort of physical thing, because the only things that exist in the universe are physical things, what right. it is to be a currency is not itself a physical category but a category of economics, right? Exactly. So does that not, in a sense, force us at least to qualify our ontological reductionism? Yes, I think, I think it does, absolutely. Um, but it, it, and in fact, I would go even further. Uh, if, if, if we're talking about ontological reductionism, I would go even further. So, so one of the things you hear often from what I refer, I'm referring to now these days as the it's all an illusion crowd. The, it's all an illusion crowd are people who claim that, you know, consciousness is an illusion, free will is an illusion, uh, you know, all sorts of mental phenomena are illusion, pain is an illusion, etc. Et they don't really exist. And they fall into a number of, of subcategories. They tend to be eliminativists. They tend to say, well, yeah. you know, once we understand, uh, you know, the physical universe as it works, you will realize that there is no such a thing as you know, pain, consciousness, and so on and so forth, which I think it's an extremely bizarre position uh, because, again, first of all, it mistakes the different levels of explanation with, with you know, and, and it mistakes ontological versus epistemic um, uh, interests. You know, I'm, you, can, you can tell me all you want that my consciousness doesn't exist, but if you want to talk to me as a human being, you better, uh, you know, behave as if I were a conscious being as opposed to, say, my computer, which is not conscious. Because if you treat us in the same way, you're not going to go very, very far. Uh, at least not with me. We may go far with the computer, but not with me. Right. So, but even, so, uh, the, the idea of that, that sort of underlines these, um, these uh, it's all an illusion crowd, which, by the way, I'll, I'll give you an example, uh, an even much more straightforward example uh, from physics itself, right? And I, so, I, the computer that, that I have in front of me, it's sitting on a table. And you often, you know, a desk. And you often hear these people, these kind of, you know, the, the, it's all an illusion crowd, telling you things like the desk doesn't really exist. You know, physics tells you that the desk is really mostly, you know, empty space and interaction of forces, you know, however you want to call it, the, the a delocalized, uh, uh, you know, um, quantum function, whatever you want to call it. Um, that is simply not true, <laughs> meaning that, and yes, of course, if you go all the way down to the quantum level, the desk is actually made of quanta, uh, whatever, right? Of, of, of quantum particles interacting with each other. Yes, but this does not negate that at the level of physical interaction that I have and that my computer sitting on this desk is having, the, the desk is very much real and it's characterized by, interestingly, physical properties that are very real, such as solidity and a particular color, and a particular shape, and so on and so forth. And to say that all of those are illusions, I think really misses the point, even ontologically. Not yeah. just epistemically, but even ontologically misses the point. So, so even at the ontological level, I think that the extreme reductionist view can be pushed back um, and up to a point. But in the case of the context, but in the context, I, I would say, of the discussion about it, uh, scientists, does it, one doesn't even need to go there. 
because the epistemic objection, I would think, uh, should be sufficient to show that a scientism is in fact a problem. Yeah, no, and I only I only went there for the sake of completeness because yeah. because you were absolutely right to distinguish ontological from epistemic reductionism, and I just wanted to make sure that we were sort of complete and and uh, that that we understood that even ontological reductionism can be too simplistically uh, conceived. Right. Um, and it seems to me that really what people tend to do is they tend to ignore that there is more than one level of description of something. Correct. Um, I can describe the dollar bill in front of me at the level of its material, that is, it's being paper. Um, but I can also describe it at the level of its being currency. And um, all the things about it that have to do with its being paper are really irrelevant um, to the discussion of it as currency, uh, which, and as currency, it's really described in sort of, a, in terms of a series of roles, right, right. Uh, and functions. Right. Uh, and so, and so I, I, I think it is valuable, though, to, to understand the, the kind of simplif oversimplification that, sci that people who embrace scientism engage in. It's not just this, this, this mistaken understanding of explanation, but also I think it's an oversimplistic conception of ontology. Right. Not only that, but since you were, we're talking about it and you, your comment made me think about one, one more qualification, it could be made at the ontological level again. Um, so the same, uh, you know, it's all an illusion crowd. It's also, uh, is also very much enamored by fundamental explanations, right? I mean, they are always going to go, want to go down to the bottom level, whatever that is. And of course, if you're a biologist, the bottom level ha happens to be the genes. If you're a chemist, the bottom level are... Uh, chemical uh, elements, and if you're a physicist, the bottom level is string theory, whatever. Uh, but the, the important point is that actually there are a number of phenomena uh, that are studied by, in fact, almost everything that is studied by the, the so-called special sciences, which are uh, essentially everything other than fundamental physics. So it includes not only biology, geology, uh, chemistry, etc., but also even part of physics, like solid-state physics. Um, everything that is studied by the special sciences actually does require often explanations at levels above yes. the one of interest. Now, we don't need to talk about debatable and, and sort of uh, um, a little bit strange concepts such as downward causality or anything like that. But let's say that I want to understand, you know, the functioning of a human being as, a, as an organism, as a living organism. Now, the reductionist crowd would say, oh, well, what you want is, is, is the genes, right? It's the genome project. It's, you, want, you want the genes on the CD, and then you understand what a human being is and how it works. Well, no. Uh, you certainly need that, but you also need a bunch of other things, including at levels higher than the human being itself, therefore, including, uh, you know, the human, being, the human race as, as a whole, in other words, as a group, as a biological species, society in which we live, the environment in which, the ecosystem in which we function, you know, there's a lot of things that are uh, involved in being a human being or a cat or a dog, whatever, you pick your, your organism, that makes sense only once you understand ecosystem ecology. And ecosystem ecology is a level of explanation much higher than the organism, not lower. Yeah. Uh, so if you only go lower, you're really missing a big part of the, 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 the picture. Now, of course, the, um, the, the preemptive uh, strike there by the Reduction is crowded as well, but even the environment and societies are made of quarks. Sure, <laughs> but you're not going to understand them right. when if you think in terms of quarks. Right, and that 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 I think is a very nice place from which to segue into a discussion of uh, purely the uh, epistemic side of this, and um, um, specifically, what what. I think that a lot of this, you know, you said you, we, we've constantly been invoking the idea of what is the explanation useful for? Um, right. And uh, that reminds us that we, we, we seek explanations and thus understanding for reasons, right? Um, right. And um, I think that the, the, the scientism crowd has a very narrow conception of what we seek explanations for, right? Um, um, we seek explanations to acquire a kind of understanding which allows us to predict phenomena and manipulate the environment. And I think the sense of manipulation that they have in mind is that, roughly that of engineering. Uh, right. would, would you agree with that, 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 that yeah. that's basically their conception of the value of explanations, of I, why I, we seek out explanations? I think that's, that's, about, that's about correct, yes. Of course, you would have to ask people from that, on that side. But yeah, that's my, that's my impression as well. Yeah. Um, 
And I think it's immediately sort of fair to ask, well, what, really, whether that's all that we that's all that we want explanations for. Right. Um, you know, I would I would argue that, you know, part of the reason why I seek explanations of, let's say, human behavior as opposed to uh, a, a inanimate a inanimate matter so that I can behave in a whole number of what we'll let's call appropriate ways. Right. Um, um, uh, so that I can behave in ways that um, uh, are, are, let's say, generous, right. ways that are kind, ways that are humane, ways that are socially positive. In other words, there's a whole bunch of competent performances that I want to be able to engage in right. that I seek the explanations for. And it seems to me that purely physical explanations would not provide me with the kind of understanding that it would make me po make it possible for me to engage in c competent performances of those kinds. Yeah, for instance, let, let's come up with you know a, a very uh, obvious, I think, example is the difference between when it comes to ethical questions between you know an approach based on moral philosophy and one based on let's say evolutionary psychology. Um, you know, plenty of people say, oh, but morality is, is just an instinct that evolved uh, in, you know, place to see in time for pro-social behavior. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, we don't know. I mean, that, that sounds like a reasonable uh, sort of just-so story to me. But nonetheless, it's a just-so story because we know nothing about genes for pro-social behavior. We know nothing about selective pressures in the place to see. You know, all of this stuff is pretty much made up. It's a reasonable story. Uh, which is different from good science, in my mind. But let's even grant that that reasonable story is true, right? So, so our pro-social behavior eventually resulted in sort of moral, uh, I mean, selection for pro-social behavior resulted in moral feelings and therefore in what we today eventually we call, you know, ethics. Yeah, sure. But if I have to have, if I'm engaging in a discussion about the morality of police br brutality, uh, for instance, since since this is in the news at the moment, it's in my um, state at the moment. Unfortunately. Exactly, it is in your state. Uh, or you know, so if if that is the question, you know, so how should the police behave in a democratic state, and how should we respond to a police abuse? And other, evolution biology tells you nothing, precisely nothing about it. Zero. You can ask, you can stare at Darwin's portrait all you want. It's not going to talk to you. Uh, what you need is a complex discourse at a much, much higher level, uh, which deals with uh, issues of social justice, issues of, you know, uh, law and constitution, you know, and things of that sort, which really the biology does, just doesn't get into it. It's, it's, a, right. it's a very distant background condition that may or may not have played a particular role in it in the inception of these things. But right now, if we're having a conversation about police brutality in your state, Darwin isn't going to do it. Uh, John Rawls is going to do it. Or, you know, the Constitution, you know, the, the founding fathers are going to do it, whatever. But definitely not Darwin. Yeah. And of course, even less quantum mechanics. Well, yes, of course. <laughs> and and let's, let's maybe even be a bit more specific about this. I mean, you know, I seek out psychological explanations of human behavior in part um, to help me understand why people do various things. And part of the reason I want to know why people do various things uh, is so that I can, in a sense, react appropriately to these sorts of uh, situations like the one you described with police brutality. Um, and um, it seems to me that um, it's relevant to me to know what beliefs the officers have in their minds while they're doing this stuff, what desires they're acting on while they're doing this stuff, uh, what the beliefs and desires are of the uh, people who are commanding them, uh, as well as what are the beliefs and desires of the people right. that they're beating the crap out of, right? right? But it doesn't seem to me like it would be relevant at all to know what neurophysiological state they're in. Right. right. I mean, there there certainly are in a particular neurophysiological state, uh, right. no question about it. But right. so what? Right. Now, the, the the right level of analysis there is psychology and sociology, uh, right. you know, the so-called uh, social sciences, but certainly not neurobiology. I mean, it, that doesn't mean that it's not interesting to take a, a I don't know a policeman in uh, riot gears and put him into a, a, a MRI scanner 
and figuring out how his brain is working. Yeah, that might be an interesting scientific question, but the fact that the, his brain is in a particular state rather than another, it's a truism. Of course, it's going to be in a particular state rather than another. Right. And that tells me very little about how to deal with that policeman or why that policeman got to react in, in the way he, he has. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I think that this goes to the question of what we want the what we want the explanations and therefore the relevant understanding for. Um, you know, I I, I thought of this example um, uh, of of a friend, uh, a dear friend in distress, and so um, I want to know why he's in distress. Um, and the reason I want to know why he's in distress is because I want to be there for him. I, I want to help him. I want right. to I want to support him and all those sorts of things. That is, I want to be able to engage in certain kinds of performances that I think that we would roughly characterize as decent, kind, virtuous, etc. Right. Um, and given that that's my aim, the reason why I want the explanation and the understanding in the first place, um, knowing that um, uh, his wife has just left him knowing that he comes from a, a family of divorce and so he feels a double sense of failure, knowing that he's worried about his children, these would all be things that if I knew them, it would help me to react in a way to him that would be supportive, humane, uh, etc. Right. No, knowing what neurophysiological state he's in would not help me in that way at all. In other right. words, I, it would not help me react appropriately in the sense of appropriateness Right. Uh, that I want. The, that, that's the reason why I sought the explanation in the first place. Now, that does not mean that there's no purpose served by a neurophysiological explanation. Of so, for example, if I'm his psychiatrist yep. and there's some issue of prescribing him some antidepressants or other medications, right. I may want to know his neurophysiological state because that's relevant to that sort of competent performance. Correct. And I guess what I think that some of the scientists don't recognize is that there's more than one kind of competent performance that we seek to uh, ac accomplish, um, and that not all of them are served by scientific understanding, or at least by physical scientific understanding. Right. I think that in, to, some, to some degree, this comes down to a, um, a difference between people who want a what I would call a monistic explanation of things, you know, a monistic explanatory approach. That is, they want to understand everything in terms of one thing. No, the, the classical theory of everything uh, in fundamental yeah. physics, yeah. as opposed to people, I guess, such as myself and, and from what I hear, uh, you, uh, who are perfectly com comfortable with uh, a plurality of explanatory levels the, and, and they pick and choose. You know, we think of explanations as based on, on, a, on a toolbox, on a very toolbox, and we pick and choose whatever uh, set of tools it seems to be more appropriate or more informative for whatever the question at hand is. And the, and, the, and the relationship between the different tools in the box is often indirect um, and sometimes incomplete. I mean, some right. of the, some, sometimes the language that's used to describe this in our business uh, is that these, are, these sciences are to some degree autonomous right. um, as opposed to the view that of, of the uni unity of the sciences, it's called, the unity of the sciences thesis. Right. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, just, just for a moment or two, to, to, want to speculate – what what is the genealogy of this? In other words, um, I understand when logical positivism was the sort of primary paradigm in in, in philosophy of science, why right. people held on to these unity of the sciences, as you call monistic, uh, a monist a preference for monistic uh, explanations. But why today do you think there are still so many people that seem to uh, want monistic explanations? I think there are two reasons, but of course I'm speculating here. But yeah, yeah, we are, of course, yes. Yeah, but this is a conversation that actually really should be uh, in, uh, I just moved my computer and you'll see a, a bumping up and down of my image for a second, but hey, it's live uh, television. That's or something, right. Right. <laughs> right? Um, so so I'm, a, I, I'm, a, I'm going to uh, speculate a little bit and I'd say that there are two causes. One is sort of a more proximate one and the other one is a little more general. Um, on the one end, I think that a lot of these people are simply quite frankly, not very familiar with philosophy of science as it has evolved after logical positivism. Um, and, and I'm talking particularly of, of a lot of scientists who, uh, especially recently, has, have been on record essentially embarrassing themselves uh, by making comments, uh, dismissive comments about philosophy. I mean, the, link is, the, the list is now, unfortunately, very long. You know, Lawrence Krauss, yeah. uh, Stephen Weinberg, Stephen Hawking, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. You know, I, I called several of them 
to task directly either on my podcast, you know, the Rationally Speaking, or on my uh, webzine, the Scantia Salon. Uh, and it, it, it just doesn't seem to stop anywhere. Although, fortunately, there is a number of scientists who have started paying attention, like Sean Carroll, for instance, yeah, recently yeah. wrote a, a nice essay asking his colleagues to just stop embarrassing themselves uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> about that. philosophy. Right. So we have some allies in that in that department. Um, but so part of it is, I think, is just ignorance, sheer ignorance. Um, about philosophy is like these people are talking as if, as Pop, as if Popper uh, was the latest thing in, in philosophy of science and of course he's already a number of decades old or the, the idea of paradigm shifts it just came out off the, uh, the, uh, hot off the presses and that right. one is, is decades, uh, decades old there's nothing wrong with being ignorant of another field I'm ignorant of plenty of fields uh, there is something wrong, however, in, in talking in the public, in public as a public intellectual with confidence about something about which you demonstrably know very little. So, I mean, that's part of the reason uh, for what we're talking about, the, the sort of the sheer ignorance of recent philosophy of science and recent developments in you know, epistemology and so on. The other, the more, the more fundamental reason, I think, for these monistic attitude or explanations is really still... Uh, in, in, for good and for bad, the um, uh, herit heritage of the Enlightenment. If you look oh. at what some of these people are saying, like take Richard Dawkins or E.O. Wilson, uh, they both explicitly said that they considered themselves sons of the Enlightenment. And, and so that explains a lot about their attitude toward science and scientific explanations, etc., etc., because, of course, the Enlightenment is a whole age of reason, uh, the, the idea was, in fact, that the, the new sciences uh, were going to solve everything and everything was going to be reduced, although Voltaire wouldn't use that term necessarily, but everything was going to be recast or reduced in, in terms of sort of the natural sciences, because which a, a, an idea that at the time was actually reasonable because the natural sciences had just gone through an explosion, right. uh, particularly in physics. And so physics, I mean, even philosophers... Uh, I was going to say went for this kind of thing. In fact, the proper, the more proper term would be fell for it. Uh, both David Hume, who is my absolute philosopher, you know, uh, um, favorite philosopher of all time, and Kant, both of them trying to recast all of philosophy and in even uh, you know moral philosophy in the light as a model in the model of, of, of Newtonian mechanics. Right. That's right. That's right. They, they conceived of psychology right. as essentially physics of the physics of uh, a human behavior, I guess, and right. um, um, and of course, uh, Descartes in the Discourse on Method, right, um, explicitly says that all human knowledge will be acquirable in the same way via these sort of geometric, almost on the model of geometry, right. um, um, and um, so I think that that's that's an interesting point. Now that, that uh, one, however, that of, that observation, sorry, at, at the time was kind yeah. of reasonable, right? I mean, you know, you just had the scientific revolution, physics was going all over the place, etc. It becomes less and less reasonable as we move away from the alignment. Uh, and yet, that position has been maintained not only by a large number of scientists, but even by a, a surprising number of philosophers. I mean, Quine, for instance, uh, you know, one of the most, arguably one of the most influential, if not the most influential philosopher, at least in the analytic tradition of the 20th century, famously said that epistemology eventually would be reduced to psychology. It's, you know, it's a branch of psychology. That's the same kind of attitude. Yeah. And I think it's wrong-headed for the same kind of reasons. Yeah. I mean, yes, um, we certainly have quite a bit to learn uh, as epistemologists from psychology, but no, I'm sorry, there, there's a difference between sort of a prescriptive and a descriptive approach to a, to a particular field. And um, so if Quine could, just, could, could keep on with that sort of attitude in the 1950s and 60s, although he kind of moderated that later on in his career, um, then it's no surprise that scientists, contemporary scientists who are much less savvy about philosophy uh, to, uh, th than, than he was, uh, still maintain that sort of attitude. So when, when Dawkins and Wilson tell me, uh, oh, I, must, I consider myself a son of the Enlightenment, you know, I have to say, my response is something on the lines of, yeah, so, so did I when I was 18, and then so I learned better. You know, it's, it's a little more complicated than that. Sure, the Enlightenment mm. still, as a matter of, you know, sort of general idea and the general principles are still uh, an interesting model to look at, and it certainly beats the crap out of a lot of other models uh, that human being, beings have ex uh, explored over the millennia. But no, it's not, it's not quite that simple. I mean, you know, Hume's fork 
uh, the idea that there is only uh, either mathematical propositions or uh, or scientific findings and everything else, any book that talks about anything else ought, as he famously said, to be uh, turned burnt into flames. Um, you know, at the time, in Hume's time, that proposition made sense and actually was revolutionary in philosophy and it did help clearing up a lot of the fog that was still the result of, of the scholastic philosophy of the Middle Ages. Yeah. But, but not today. We're in the 21st century. We really ought to know better than, than that. And by, incidentally, uh, as I often often point out to my students, um, even though I love Hume to death, uh, if we actually had to practice what he was preaching, we should burn Hume's inquiry into nature, into <laughs> human understanding, because it contains neither mathematics nor empirical facts. So, you know, there you go. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, actually, though, just very quickly, I do wonder whether the Enlightenment uh, conception of explanation was entirely an improvement over that of the past. Um, you know, I think under a certain reading, Aristotle's account of explanation in terms of four distinct types of causes right. can be interpreted in a way that's con con that's that's um, commensurate with contemporary materialism, right. and more treats the, f the 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 four causes as uh, the different ways and uh, levels of description of an object that we or an event that we might that we might make um, that um, allows us to. Uh, offer explanations that answer very different types of uh, yeah. uh, questions. Um, yeah. You know, you know, you know what we were talking about, what's, a, what do we want the explanation for? What do we un want the understanding for? Do I want the understanding so that I can give this guy a drug that will make him feel better? Or do I want this understanding so that I can be a good friend to him yeah. uh, that each of those aims would require a addressing the causes of his behavior at a very different level of description. I think Aristotle actually provides us with at least a rough framework in which to do something like that. Whereas by the time you get to the Enlightenment, causation becomes simply means right. the material and the efficient cause, right? Yeah. It, no, it, that, it's, that's it. Well, I'm sure that our audience will notice that we're wearing different clothes all of a sudden, and that's because we had technical difficulties about three quarters of the way through our discussion. And we had to stop it and uh, take it up again the, the next day. And so, um, <laughs> like all good, uh, like all good Americans, we change our clothes every day. And, wait, wait, um... wait! I thought we were <laughs> going to make up a story about time travel and all that. You know, much more I'm interesting. So... Okay, uh, fine. I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> fine. Um, so the the audience doesn't need to be be reminded of what we were talking about, but we do. Um, <laughs> Massimo, I'd asked you about what you thought some of the, the, the reasons, the deep reasons were for why uh, scientism is, a, is appealing to people. And we were talking about what you called explanatory monism, the idea that right. um, there's only really one kind of genuine explanation and thus one kind of understanding that results from that explanation. Uh, and you had actually said that you thought that much of it is due to their uh, indebtedness to the Enlightenment. Right. Because in the Enlightenment, certainly there was the idea that, in a sense, uh, physics and science would explain everything one day. Descartes says this explicitly in the Discourse on Method. Right. And, and then I'd, I'd said, actually, that I thought that this was in a, bit, a bit of a regression from antiquity when Aristotle imagined uh, four different types of causes, ways of understanding the world around us. And then you had had some interesting things to say about that that maybe you could say again. Well, so first of all, you do realize we're beginning to sound like two old men, you know, ah, the good old times of Aristotle, you know, <laughs> right, right. before the Lawrence Enlightenment Krauser came in it. and ruined things, yes. <laughs> right. um, now, so, <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. Aristotle did have a more comprehensive, more pluralistic, as I, as I uh, like to put it, um, view of causality of, of, and, and in particular of understanding, you know, of, of why is it we ask certain kinds of questions? Because that's what it, what it's talking, what, what really it boils down to. And uh, as we said um, before, the, the the new the current attitude of people who I would consider uh, uh, engage in scientific activities uh, or, or, or notions um, is that they really do want to uh, enlightenment like to boil down everything to one bottom level of, of analysis, which I think is questionable on, on ontological grounds and certainly uh, not, but not, not, doesn't work well at all at, uh, on epistemic grounds. So, yes, Aristotle. Indeed, a few years ago, I published a um, paper in a technical journal in biology arguing that the Aristotelian, uh, the Aristotelian framework can actually be updated and, and, and used in uh, some of the special sciences, especially in biology, 
Um, because in fact it is more comprehensive, it does address these different levels of explanation that with which, for instance, different uh, uh, biological disciplines are concerned themselves. So if you want to know something about you know mechanisms at a at a at a bottom level, you you go for genetic and molecular biology. But if you're interested in sort of more you know higher level explanations of how organisms uh, work, you go for developmental biology. But you also go for things like uh, what Aristotle would have called, uh, you know, would have thought of in terms of certain anomic, you know, f final causes. Uh, final causes that f uh, ironically uh, be excluded from uh, science by, uh, you know, by the, the, the Enlightenment and post Enlightenment philosophers, you know, who thought that asking why is, is just not a meaningful question in scientific terms. But they were, in fact, reintroduced by Darwin. Because when we say, you know, why is it that the eye, the human eye exists and works in a certain way, that question is perfectly meaningful. It doesn't involve an intelligent designer uh, who, you know, with purpose, but it does involve a purpose. And it's it's purpose of, um, you know, which has been favored by natural selection. It's, it's, not, it's a mindless purpose, if you like, but it's a final cause nonetheless. I mean, it, make, it is perfectly sensible to make a distinction when you ask, you know, why is the human eye this way to make a distinction between what is it made of, uh, you know, with the specific kinds of materials, how it is assembled, you know, the specific you know, uh, um, way in which it is put together or develops, and also why it exists to begin with, you know, what, what is its function, what is right. it for, which is right. a classic Aristotelian uh, question, you know, what is this thing for? And isn't, is, it, is it not the case that we've talked, we also have talked quite a bit about reductionism, is it not the case that one of the problems with reducing biology to physics is precisely that the notion of uh, purpose is ineliminable from biological discourse and is not reproducible at the, in the language of physics? That's right. That's, that's exactly right. And in fact, that doesn't go just for biology. It goes for all the social sciences. You, know, it's like, you, know, you yes, can't talk course. about uh, psychology or sociology or economics without talking about purpose. And purpose does disappear at the quantum level. Now, you can say, therefore, you can you know, sort of bite the bullet one way and say, well, therefore, uh, purpose is, is really an illusion, what I refer to as the it's all an illusion crowd, and, right. um, and, and be done with that and say, well, there is no such thing as purpose. It's all uh, you know, uh, quirks or, or, or strings. You could go that way, but it really is an impoverished view of explanations. I, I think you're missing right. a lot if you go that way. Yeah. And you don't get the kind of understanding that you want if, if we focus on the fact that we want explanations to provide understanding that then enables us to do various things. Right. Um, that level of explanation, is, as we discussed already, is not going to provide you with the kind of understanding that you need in order to do a lot of the things that we want to do. Um, you also said you wanted to talk a little bit more about um, uh, the scientismist's uh, <laughs> overestimation of, of science or its, expan uh, uh, its expansive view of science. Yeah, I, I really do think that's one of the crucial uh, issues in this discussion. And let me, let me, let me try to explain the way I see it. So... Uh, people who engage in scientism, uh, like uh, you know Alex Rosenberg among philosophers, or, or Jerry Coyne, uh, or Lawrence Krauss among uh, you know biologists and physicists, uh, just to pick on, on some examples, uh, they will say they will advance an argument like you know there's nothing uh, special about any other way of knowing, like let's say, or any other approach to things, like say like philosophy or mathematics or anything. It's all based on the empirically based application of human reasoning. And uh, therefore, in their mind, there's no particularly relevant distinction between, let's say, Coyne's ex famous example is between plumbing and, you know, quantum physics. It's just that quantum physics is much more complicated and much more cutting edge than plumbing. But otherwise, they're both empirically based, you know, hypothesis testing kind of observations where human beings engage in sort of certain kinds of reason. Now, you could go that way. I mean, I can see the, the, the sense of going that way. It, it's not, it, it isn't nonsensical or anything like that. But if you go that way, it seems to me that there is a huge price to pay. Because if you want to say that, uh, there's nothing special about science, that it's just, you know, common sense writ large, something like that, uh, then you cannot say that, and then at the same time, reject other ways of knowing before being not scientific, because you just equated science with human thinking. You know, and, and if you do that, then anything goes. Then then we don't have, you don't have a luxury to, re to reject philosophy 
as useless or mysticism as hopeless or anything like that. You, you, you can only say specific philosophical notions are mistaken here is why, or specific mystical notion are mistaken here is why. But you can't just say, well, science, put at the same time, put science on a pedestal as something that we should imitate and strive for, which I think it is, by the way. Um, and, but, but, but at the same time, uh, at the same time, this, uh, the reverse of that coin is also, well, yeah, but everything is science, you know, it's, it's, it's just a, a general way in which human beings think. So I think it's much more um, sensible to say that, yes, there is a continuum for sure uh, between science and other kinds of human epistemic activities. It would be really bizarre if science all of a sudden came out of nowhere and it represented a qualitatively different way for humans to think. Just in the way, by the way, in which philosophy or mathematics or logic are continuous with uh, other kinds, you know, normal, everyday human thinking. I mean, after all, it's not like mathematicians are not normal human beings. They, they, they have the same brain that the rest of us uh, have, and, and they use it in essentially the same way. But does that imply that mathematics is not a sufficiently distinct kind of analysis, or kind of way of doing things or approaching things? Respect with respect to let's say science or or, or uh, mysticism or I mean I think that would be really bizarre, and besides, to, as I pointed out before, two can play that game. If you want to say that look everything that has to do with empirical information you know empirical evidence is science, uh, I can and therefore well it's it, it's all about science. Then I can say well look then anything that has to do with human thinking. As is philosophy, because that's what it is about. It's rational thinking. Right. And therefore, in fact, right. and if everything is philosophy, that would become silly. I mean, you could make that argument, but it would be silly because, you know, what, what would be the point of expanding the meaning of the word philosophy or the meaning of the word science to encompass almost everything? At that point, it loses me. Every, everything yeah. becomes science. You know, I've actually had people arguing with me that. You know, the fact that I got to the Graduate Center at, uh, in the middle of Manhattan today from my apartment in Chelsea by navigating the, the, the streets of Manhattan in a certain way, since this was reasoning based on empirical evidence, I was doing science. Hell no, I wasn't doing yeah. science. I mean, if that's what you mean by science, I'm sorry. That, that, that makes no sense to me. Right, and, and you know, you you run the risk of, of losing all the distinctions that, that, that make the various, uh, give the various sciences the significance that they have. Right. Um, and I think that this, um, this goes more than just simply beyond when these people are talking in their more casual moments. Um, I think as, as was discussed, maybe in an article on Santia Salon or, or in one of the interviews I've watched with you, um, there are now physicists who are arguing that science should not even, re that we shouldn't even require that science be empirical. Right? That's that, right. Si that science, that that uh, I think it's string theory, yeah, um, yeah. which is basically unconfirmable, um, and so um, they they said, well, it's science anyway. Um, yes, we had uh, two ass essays at uh, Scancia Salon, one by Peter Voigt, who is a physicist at um, uh, Columbia, who is a well-known uh, critic of string theory. He published a number of years ago a book called Not Even Wrong about string theory. <laughs> and um, and uh, Jim Baggott, who is a, a science journalist with a background in physics, who has written more recently a book uh, critical of certain aspects of certain directions of uh, fundamental physics, which is called Farewell to Reality. And the, both of them argue that, yes, in fact, there are some physicists now who, faced by the reality that String theory has been around for decades, and it hasn't managed so far to come up with a single empirically testable uh, prediction, you know, novel prediction. It, it predicts all sorts of things that we already know, but that's not, you know, that's not that difficult, really. Um, so it has failed in that sense, and, and a number of string physicists, physicists now are beginning to actually admit that that is the case. So at that point, what do you do? You either bite the bullet and say, hey, uh, we tried this thing for 30, 40 years, didn't work, let's try something else, or... Um, or even worse, you know, we don't know what else to try at this moment, so we're stumped. So that would be one way, so the, 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 the humility uh, road, if, if you will. Uh, the other one is, which is some string theory, not by, certainly not all, or in fact at the moment not even a majority, but some string theory are going the other way and say, well, hell with that. Uh, that means we're going to redefine what science means and how it works. Uh, we are going to enter into a, a post-empirical uh, period of science uh, where theories are going to be tested by mathematical 
beauty and internal coherence as opposed to instead of you know sort of making content with the empirical world and like say wait a minute hold up first of all we have already a name for that kind of activity it's called metaphysics you know it's it's yeah. when, when when metaphysics is in the business of logically or mathematically it doesn't matter because at that point the distinction becomes one with little, very little of a difference uh, metaphysics is in the business of logically finding out things about the world without actually have uh, you know looking at empirical evidence and so all of a sudden physicists who have always been very disdainful as a group with notable exceptions of metaphysics all of a sudden they're turning the entire enterprise into metaphysics this is, this yeah. is just strange to their credit some of the scientists scientifically oriented people like Lawrence Krauss actually reject that approach and they say no this is, this is crazy uh, it just means we're on the wrong track we need to uh, yeah. go back and do something else and you know, find other ways of doing this thing. You know, this, is, this is nonsense. Uh, but it's interesting to me as a philosopher of science uh, that, that that is the current state of, uh, of the discussion in fundamental physics. That, and to me, that also shows just how close certain areas of physics, of theoretical physics, are to philosophy of science and to philosophy of physics. Uh, yeah. And which, of course, is something that a number of physicists just seem to be oblivious about. Yeah. So, I, you know, the last thing that I had on our on our list of things to talk about um, uh, follows very nicely from 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 this point about the over expansive view of science, um, and uh, and also uh, fits nicely with uh, what we talked about earlier in terms of different levels of explanation providing different kinds of understanding that then make possible different kinds of successful performances. I wanted to talk um, at lastly about um, what role, if any, uh, fine arts and literature play ah. uh, in, in if explanation is perhaps stretching a little bit, but in, prov in providing understanding right. um, uh, in this, this picture that we've been painting, this more pluralistic picture. And um, it's it's a subject that's that's dear to my heart. I teach a course called Philosophical Ideas and Literature, where the entire yeah. reading list for the course is all novels. Sure. Uh, and um, I, I've just noticed that, and I've also taught humanities surveys in which there's a mixture of philosophy, visual art, music, some the, some religious t uh, material and stuff. Um, and I found that 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 there is a very distinct a distinct and substantial sort of understanding that comes from uh, the experience uh, of fine arts and the reading of literature. Um, I'll just give one, one very sort of simple example. Um, you know, I could spend two weeks talking about the sociology, the politics, the religion of, uh, of Renaissance Italy uh, in trying to help students to understand the humanistic ideal. Right. Um, but simply showing them and talking them through paintings by Michelangelo and Raphael and, and others um, almost accomplish the tasks, accomplishes the task more effectively. Right. Uh, um, and um, I think one of the more interesting and difficult things is to, is to sort of try and sort through how that exactly is, how that's accomplished. Right. Um, Gilbert Ryle had a famous essay on Jane Austen where he talks about um, the ways in which Jane Austen, in the sense, teaches, uh, helps us to understand ethics better through literature. He referred to it as the wine tasting method. <laughs> um, and I think that probably this sort of maps onto his distinction that he makes b between knowing how and knowing that. Right. Um, and I'm wondering if, uh, if you have opinions on this um, and thoughts on this, or whether you think really that once we get to arts and literature, we're really not talking uh, about epistemic activities. Anymore. No, I think we are. I mean, of course, we're also talking about aesthetics and we're talking about you yes, know, art and yes, all that. Yes. But if we're talking about uh, art and literature from a epistemic perspective, I think you're, you're right. I think there are at least two ways I can see uh, those contributing to those activities contributing to human understanding. One is the one that you just very nicely um, uh, laid out, which is uh, it, for certain kinds of things, uh, uh, Arts and literature help us understanding things because they help us uh, visualizing or or um, empathizing uh, or or putting ourselves in the shoes or into an, a different framework. I mean, I can imagine even, for instance, uh, students learning about the Renaissance in a different way by a good movie 
even fictional yeah. movie uh, made, yeah. you know, as long as it is, of course, historically accurate and all that. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, because it has that kind of immediate impact, you know, emotional impact, imagery, and that sort of stuff. Now, I wouldn't substitute, you know, a, a study of the history of the Renaissance uh, for for with, with with a movie, but I certainly would integrate it. And and reading, uh, you know, documents or looking at paintings and all that sort of stuff, or architecture and that that sort of things. Those are, in fact, very very valuable at the very least integrators of a more formal sort of study of, let's say, history or or any other or ethics, or, you know, any other uh, human endeavor. So I think you're absolutely right on, on that one. Uh, now, of course, with the caveat, which goes back to Plato, that um, arts can also manipulate, uh, you know, the, the, a, yes, a novel can also manipulate you emotionally in a way that it's actually negative and, and actually diminishes yes. your understanding. Um, you know, yes. if we want to alienate, I, I'm about to alienate half of your listeners probably, but uh, uh, Ayn Rand comes, as, comes up as, as an example uh, to my yeah, mind. You yeah. know, her, her novels, are, other than the fact that they're really badly written, um, they're also very clearly emotionally manipulative for, you know, to send a message that, that I think it's highly questionable on, on, on philosophical grounds. Anyway, so now that we lost half of the audience, um, the second part, uh, the second way in which this can happen if you think about it, there is a long uh, tradition in philosophy of using dialogues, which are fictional, uh, right. as ways to explore, not just to teach, but to explore a, uh, and come to an, a new understanding of certain, of certain uh, issues. So, obviously, we've got the Platonic dialogues, but we've got you know, David Hume, uh, for instance if we want to jump several several centuries and or bark barkley yes that's right yeah. so so now even though today philosophers unfortunately i think uh don't engage as often um in, in sort of that kind of literary pursuit the the idea is you know if i actually written a few dialogues just for for fun you you, you find a couple at uh, in my former blog rationally speaking and one of the things that uh, I noticed while I was writing them is that I was having the same kind of internal epistemic experience as when I'm writing actually a, uh, an essay, you know, prose uh, uh, on, on a particular topic. That is, typically, uh, if I decide to write something uh, on, a, on a topic, I, you know, I do some readings in the background and I think about, you know, the general outline and then I start writing and literally my thinking happens when I'm writing. It's, it's not like I know where I'm going in details. I might know the general yeah. idea, but not the details. And in fact, sometimes I surprise myself. And once I start putting things, you know, black and white, as they say, uh, or pixels on pixels in, in, in these days, uh, it turns out that I'm actually surprising myself. I'm going in the direction. I say, okay, wait, now that I put this thought in, in, in uh, black and white in front of me, it actually doesn't make any sense. It needs to be uh, thought out, you know, differently and so on and so forth. So I actually learn by writing, essentially or I discovered what I think by writing. At that point, it makes little difference what, I, what I'm writing is uh, prose, is a formal, you know, it's an essay, uh, or is it a dialogue, it's fiction. Yeah. Because either way, I don't know it, where I'm going necessarily, and I'm discovering things, therefore I'm coming up with hopefully original thoughts, or at least thoughts that are original to me. Uh, and therefore, I'm actually discovering it, it is an epistemic activity. It's not just a question of uh, um, helping others understand what I think. It's a question of helping myself understand what I think or developing what I think. So absolutely, I think that, that uh, the arts and humanities are part of that sort of general idea of scantia, which is, as you know, the name of my, of my new webzine ver venture. Uh, that is, it's, it's knowledge much, much more broadly construed than just, you know, the, the natural sciences uh, um, or, or mathematics or something like that. It's, right. it's, it's knowledge broadly construed because it's not just about discovering new things. Yes, of course, we do need to discover new things, so we need empirical evidence for stuff. We also need to think about stuff. We need to connect them. We need, we, uh, we need to understand. And all of those activities are helped by not just the natural sciences, but philosophy, mathematics, logic, and the arts and the humanities. Yeah, and you know, um, I, I like the way you just put that. And, and it occurs to me that the word understand has several uses. I mean, one of them is in the purely epistemic sense, but we also use the word understand when we, when we describe someone as being an understanding person. Right. Um, or when someone comes to us, a friend or a relative in distress, and we tell them, I understand. Exactly. Um, um, there is a, there is, a, and, and it makes me think that maybe 
um, the arts provide us with the sorts of, and I, I'm putting explanation in square quotes because I don't have any other uh, word, that provides us maybe with understanding that, that, that enables us to function at that level most profoundly um, um, because it confronts us at the level of direct experience. Uh, it directly engages our emotional, our emotions and our sensibilities um, and, and, and thus uh, moves us in a way that perhaps uh, ep more, more uh, uh, traditionally epistemic activities keep us a little bit at a distance. Um, I, I noticed that, that, for example, um, a novel or a, a really, a really well-made film or, 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 or music or can, can, can almost get me to uh, appreciate the urgency of something. Uh, right. In a way that um, a, a more dispassionate uh, engagement with the subject matter. Certainly, if I read the literature of totalitarianism, if I read Orwell or if I read uh, Huxley, um, I'm much more impressed with the urgency of not allowing society to become this way That's right. than if I merely learn about it from a dispassionate uh, perspective. That's right. Well, I can give a, a personal example. So, uh, some time ago, I moved from being an omnivore who was rather little concerned in terms of diet, uh, very little concerned with, or rather little concerned with, with sort of the ethics of food to what I call now a ethical omnivory. That is, uh, I actually very much concerned where my food comes from and, and, and whether, you know, I still eat animals, but, uh, but, I'm, but only if I can be reasonably assured that they did not suffer and I had a good life, et cetera, et cetera. Otherwise, I revert to actually, for, for all effective purposes, functional vegetarianism. Now, mm -hmm. the reason this happened is, is, is the following. Uh, for a number of years, I've been talking to colleagues and, and friends who were vegetarians and and we're talking to me, you know, we were exploring so the, 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 the ethical reasons, environmental reasons and all that. And I would readily grant that their points were absolutely correct. I mean, there was no defense against the right. ethical and environmental points in favor of vegetarianism. And yet I couldn't bring myself to become a vegetarian. Right. And so at some point, this, this you know, this obviously this generated some kind of uh, increasing degree of, of uh, cognitive dissonance because uh, come on, I'm yes. a philosopher. I realize that somebody is right. I tell them that they're right. So why the hell can I can I not act uh, accordingly, right? Yeah, yeah. And at some point, I forced myself to watch a uh, one of a series of a number of documentaries on on actually how animals are actually treated. Uh, in other words, I exposed myself on purpose to the emotional. Uh, manipulation yeah. because it is emotional manipulation it's, it's this reason you know it's for a good uh, cause but it is emotional manipulation and that's what i actually made the jump at that point after seeing the document i said okay now my emotions are in sync with my reasoning and yeah. now i can actually i i can master the, the willpower to actually pay attention to these things in practice, which I've done now for a number of years, and uh, and I never looked back. So that to me, you know, it's a, it's a good example. I mean, it's a personal example, but it's a good example of, of how understanding has a number of different aspects to it, and you can definitely understand something at a sort of abstract, rational level, and yet not really understanding in the sense of, of making it part of who you are. And, and that's a yeah. major component of what we should mean by understanding. Yeah, and to go back to Hume, and this is the last thing I'll, I'll sort of say on this, is that um, you know Hume famously always said that that morals couldn't be a matter of reason because reason doesn't move us; right. uh, only sentiment moves us. And perhaps um, the arts, uh, uh, more than any other endeavor that we engage in, have the capacity to directly engage us at the at the at the level of sensibility, and thus to move us uh, when. Uh, the the mere possession of the knowledge would not have been enough, and your example is really fantastic. And and the same sort of thing could have role could have been played by a novel, yes. by something like Watership Down, yeah. or or by Charlotte Charlotte's Web, right. or or um, uh, where, where where you know you're desperately sad that you're thinking Wilbur's going to get slaughtered and eaten, um um and um. So uh, I think that that's a really, really, a really, really nice way of, yeah. of putting uh, how this Again, works. that said, with the caveat, of course, that you still want your brain to be, you know, engaged at a, uh, also at the at sort of the rational yes. level, because otherwise you open yourself to be manipulated. Again, Plato there yes. was probably, in fact, not probably, was certainly wrong in sort of excluding, uh, you know, uh, fiction and poetry, I think it was, from, the, from his ideal republic. 
Um, but he did have a good point that you, you need to be on guard because it is yes. easy, unfortunately, to be manipulated emotionally. And so it's a, it's about and any, any neurobiologist, you know, cognitive scientist like Antonio Damasio, for instance, today will tell you that uh, a, a functional human being is, in fact, a balance of, you know, emotional and rational decision making. Uh, if you become too emotional, then you're manipulated, you become unstable, you, you, you're non-functional. But if you become too rational, if you give too much weight to the rational side, then you become a sociopath. Yeah. And what we're really, I think, what the thread has been throughout our conversation is making the case for, for a pluralism um, and not, you know, we're against sort of a scientific monism in, in, our, in our endeavors to understand the world. But we'd also, of course, be against some kind of romanticism, exactly. um, which would itself be a, another kind of monism that would be equally um, um, impoverished uh, in terms of our dealing with the world. Precisely. Well, Massimo, this was really uh, terrific. I really enjoyed this, and um, I hope the audience uh, gets a lot out of it. And we seem to make it through despite our technical issues. And we, we managed to show, uh, you know, more than one uh, element from our well, workbook. So, <laughs> right. and I'll put I'll get as many links to the things we talked about up as possible. Obviously, people should go over and check out Santa Ceylon, where a lot of these issues are being discussed in articles that you post and in the comments threads afterwards. And I hope to see you again soon. Absolutely, it was a pleasure. Thanks, Massimo.